As we begin the Advent season, first of all, I want to read the two scriptures that we have selected for today. The first one comes from the book of Isaiah, the seventh chapter. Typically, this is one of the books that when we talk about the prophecies of Jesus coming, we look to Isaiah because there are a lot of prophecies in Isaiah. We'll say a little more about that in a minute. This is the seventh chapter, verse 14. Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a young woman shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. And then from the gospel according to Matthew, and this is the beautiful Christmas story which we hear each and every year. And we need to let those words sink into our hearts and minds as we begin the season. First chapter, verses 18 through 25. And in years past, I've had members of the congregation read the scripture, read this passage. And I just wanted to mention that one that I'm, that the name that's written in my Bible for reading this one time was Debbie Bingham. The late Debbie Bingham who read this had a beautiful voice and, and read this passage for us. She was a great contribution to the church, as many are, and, and as all of you are, that's a part of our journey. It's a part of the Advent journey. 1, 18 through 25. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph before they came together, she was found to be with child of the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, revolved resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save the people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord has spoken to the prophet, and we just read this. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and his name shall be called Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but he knew her not until she had borne a son, and he called his name Jesus. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading and the hearing of his word. The English poet of the 18th century, Alexander Pope, wrote a lot of things. He was very prolific in what the, the, his production. He was a Christian, very devout Christian, who believed that God had divinely designed the world in which we live. So unlike many poets of different ages whose spirituality or religion was something different or even non-existent in their opinion, Pope was a very Christian person. And he wrote these words from which the title of today's sermon comes, Hope springs eternal in the human breast. Man never is but always to be blessed. Say a word about Pope at that point. He wrote a lot of things in couplets. If you heard, that's two sentences that rhyme. For those of you who are English scholars who remember your English from when in school, it's in iambic pentameter. It's five beats to, the, to the, each line, and it's a special type of beat that is there. He said of his writing, I lisp in couplets, for the couplets came. This is the way he wrote. So this is one of those couplets that has come down to us, that hope springs eternal. We may have even thought that was something that was scriptural, because it sounds scriptural. Hope springs eternal. Changed it just a little bit to say, hope always springs eternal. This particular passage came from the essay on man, the first epistle in 1732. As we begin our journey 
our 2002 journey to the manger. The first step, as it has been for two millennia plus, 2,000 plus years now, is taken, understandably, reasonably, it's taken in hope. That first step is taken in hope. Hope that expectation that everything will be better. When you hope, what do you do? You say, I hope it doesn't rain when church is out. I hope tomorrow is better than yesterday. I hope this week is better than last week. This year is better than last year. On and on and on. It's part of the human nature because we just don't want to say, okay, I'm totally satisfied. We've talked about that before. We don't want to say, I'm totally satisfied. We want to say, I hope things improve. I hope things get better. You can all think in your own minds, what do you hope for? What do you hope to see improve? Hope doesn't, hope doesn't indicate in any way, form, or fashion things staying the same. Hope is a, a word filled with expectations. It's filled with, with what we, well, hope will happen. And it makes sense that that's where we were, would start our journey to Advent. Pope and Alexander Pope and so many of his writings held out this eternal sense of hope. Because if we don't have hope, personally, collectively, as a country, as a church, as a civic organization, whatever, a family, if we don't have hope, we don't have anything. It's just like being dead in the water. One time I bought a boat. I know some of you have had boats. Bob has boats that run. Mine didn't. Bought this boat from this guy. <laughs> Bought this boat from this guy. A little old wooden boat. Had an old 35 horsepower motor on it. I thought, this is the greatest deal I've ever made. Well, where I live on the Kentucky River, it's like living on a creek compared to where you are here on the... But nonetheless, it's water and it's fun. So I took my little boat, went way up the river, and it quit. It would not start. And I had to get back to the dock when my boat wouldn't start. My motor wouldn't start. Got the boat back to the dock with help from passers-by and people that pulled so forth. And finally, I decided I've had the last of the hope for this boat. It's going and I let it go. But I had hope. I thought, well, this is a cute little thing. This is something the guy that had the dock where we had a boat dock, he said, this, is, this boat's all right. We can keep this boat running. We can keep this boat in good shape. We can keep this boat so you can use it. No, it was not that way. Sometimes it doesn't work out. That doesn't stop you from hoping whatever it is that you want to see happen. The birth of Jesus, something in your life, that begins with hope, begins with prayer. This is a part that's a part of our human souls that we need to tap into. Pope wrote about it. The Bible wrote about it. Many, many people have written about it. So what do we hope for? Where do we want to go? What do we want to do? We look around and we look back in the scriptures. Things were bad then. You remember in your history and in your study that at this particular time, the coming of Jesus, the people of God were under the heel, the foot, the rule of Rome. They were looking, for, hoping for a Messiah. They were looking for someone who would lead them from this bondage to Rome. They would lead them from the bondage and take them and let them be the people that they wanted to be, the people that they hoped to be. What holds you down? See, we don't just talk about Jesus with this or what happened in this story 2,000 years ago. What holds you from being what you want to be, what you want to accomplish, 
what you want to hope for. These scriptures provide us such great inspiration. Things were bad. They needed help. We read these prophecies here. We've talked many, many times in classes, and we will have other classes, which I will share more of this. But one of my professors in the seminary talked about these prophecies. The prophecies, as we speak academically, the prophecies weren't particularly about Jesus. The prophecies were about a Messiah, about a Messiah. And sometimes people would come along, they would be born, they would grow up, they would think, maybe this is the Messiah. Maybe this is the one that fulfills the Scripture. But then invariably something happened to them. What they were looking for, as we all know, was a military king. Who's going to take us out of this? Then came Jesus. And that was not the Messiah. That was not the Messiah they were expecting. That's why so many of the people that Jesus came to, the Jewish nation at that point, they rejected him because he said, they said, this is not who we want. We need someone else. Study tells us that who they were looking for to fit in with the Old Testament, to fit in with what they had, was a person who fulfilled two qualities in life. One was they wanted, they wanted someone who would be the new Moses. Moses was considered the lawgiver. Moses was the one who brought the Ten Commandments. Moses it was the one who led the people out of the wilderness. Moses was the lawgiver. They wanted someone who would lead the people that could, could just lead them. That's what they wanted. And they also wanted people. You know, people, they're, they're picky. What kind of leader do you want? You ever sit on a pulpit committee in a church? You ought to sit on my side of a pulpit committee in a church. Finally, it's just you wonder, well, what else do they want? Do they want me to submit nude pictures of my family? Or what, what do they want? They want everything. What do you think about this? What do you think about that? What do you think about the other? I just finally gave up on that. I thought, I can't answer all these things. But this is what they wanted. They wanted a lawgiver, and they wanted a charismatic leader. You know what char charisma is? We watch Son-in-Law every year. The movie was Polly Shore at Thanksgiving. And he's going around the dorm with his little camera of the 1990s visit and vintage. And he sees usually a pretty girl, pretty co-ed there. And he'll say, charisma. And then he goes into what it's a quality. And he recites what it's a quality of leadership and so forth. And then he's talking to her. And she's saying, what the heck? And he sees somebody else going down the hall. Takes off with... I'm sorry I'm moving around so much. I know that's driving you all crazy. Just got to stand up there and move with me. Wherever I go, just go with me. I'm not going any. I'll stay right here. Follows her down the hall. He says, charisma. And he quotes that again. Well, that's what the people were looking for. They wanted someone like King David. King David was far from perfect, but, man, he was a heck of a leader. It's kind of like comparing. I, I hesitate to do this. Joe, my apologies. It's kind of like comparing Mark Stoops and John Calipari. One has charisma and one doesn't. Anyone who follows UK sports can probably pick out the one that doesn't have a whole lot of oomph and so forth going on. Well, they both are having pretty successful programs. They both make more than I do. Does that, do any of you make $8.6 million a year? Gee, I'd love to make that kind of money. I thought that would be great. $8.6 million here, and you lose to Vanderbilt with your football team. And you lose to St. Peter's in the first round of the NCAA. And you get $8.6 million, and you get a raise. You get a continuation, but you got charisma. You got the job. You're getting it done. We hope. That's what they hoped of Jesus. Give us somebody that can, one, get the job done, and give us someone that can inspire us as a leader. There are two different characteristics. You can find people who can get the job done, but they just, they just don't inspire others as they need to. Or you can find somebody who inspires people, but they don't have a clue what they're doing. They're just kind of inspirational. 
What they were looking for was someone who came together, a certain kind of a leader. And what did God send? What did God send? He sent a baby. He sent a baby. Now, which of the two characteristics did that fulfill? Was this person the good lawgiver? Or was this person the charismatic leader? Matthew 1, again. I want to look at one verse, one only, 23. The one we started with on Isaiah. Virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and his name shall be called Emmanuel, which is God with us. One of the anthems that the choir sings, community choir in our choir here at church when we had one, is this little number called, Who Would Send a Baby? I know Shirley's going to say, why didn't you give me that before church and I could have played that for you. That would have been fine. But the words are these. Who would send a baby to heal a world in pain? Who would send a baby, a tiny child, when the world, let, that, this is great, this is just as appropriate then, now, and maybe tomorrow. When the world is crying for the promised one, who would send his only son? Who would send his only son? Who would send a baby to light the world with love? Who would send a baby? We're going on with the Advent candle a tiny child, when the world is hoping for the promised one, who would send his only son? Who would, send a, who would choose a manger to cradle a king? Who would send angels to sing? Who would hang a star above the shine on the gift of his infinite love? Who would send a baby to bless a world with peace? Who would send a baby, a tiny child, when the world is yearning for the promised one, who would send a baby? Who would send a baby? God sent the baby to heal the world in pain. And that's where we start. The hope of Advent, the peace, the joy, the love as we celebrate this great season. Are we about together in prayer? Oh, God, we can't explain anything that you do. And that's great because that's what makes you God and makes us who we are. But we can embrace what you do. We can embrace what you do. We can embrace the moment. We can embrace the way that you reach out to us. We can embrace what you do in our lives. And today, O oh God, we embrace the moment. For we ask the question, who would send a baby? And the answer is, you sent Jesus, your only begotten Son. May we be blessed through this month. May the living child grow and bless and lead and guide and inspire us. In his name we ask it.